Hi students. In this next topic, we're going to be looking at how ecosystems work, or also known as the study of ecology. So in order to understand how we're impacting the planet and how we are impacting living things on the planet, we need to understand a little bit about the natural systems that are in place. And these natural systems, uh, again, are sort of encompassed in this field of what we're going to call ecology. So in this lecture, we're going to discuss what ecology is, and we're going to talk about two of the most sort of important parts of studying ecology. We're going to talk about how energy flows through an ecosystem and how matter cycles around an ecosystem. We're also going to talk about interactions amongst uh, different types of organisms that are in these ecosystems. So first and foremost, what is ecology? So you remember when we were talking about environmental science, we said that environmental science contains components of lots of different things, right? So we had components of biology and geology and chemistry and even physics and some things. So ecology is, is more of a specific biology focused field, but again, it's important for our overall understanding of how humans are impacting the environment. We have to understand the environment first. So there's a field called ecology in which we are essentially studying interactions amongst living things, amongst each other, so how living things are acting with each other, and also how they're interacting with what we're going to call their abiotic environment. So abiotic simply means the not living things that they need. So in an, in an environment, we can break things down into two different categories. Everything that's alive and whatever's not alive, but is still necessary for life. So again, living things, that makes sense. Anything that's an organism. The non-living things, though, are physical things in their environment that they need. So living things uh, need, they need space. They need space to actually live. They need um, things like particular temperatures, sunlight, soil, some amounts of precipitation, uh, air to breathe. All of those things constitute, again, their abiotic environment. So these are things that, once again, living things are going to be interacting with these factors. So again, we call them biotic and abiotic. When we're looking at ecology, we can have either a very local focus or we can have an entire global focus. Just depends on what we want to look at. Ecology has a lot of parallels to environmental science because it happens to be one of the broadest fields in all of biology because not only are you looking at life, you're also looking at things that are essentially part of geology and chemistry and physics. And so that's how I, kind of how ecology ties in very nicely with our discussion of environmental science. So <clears throat> there's a couple of vocabulary terms that I kind of want to talk you through because we'll be hitting on these words um, as we move through the class. The first is a population. So we can study a group of organisms of the same species that all live in the same place at the same time. So that's one level we can start studying as a study of ecology. We can study a population of something walruses, grass, blackbirds, whatever we want to study, right? That would be our smallest grouping. We can move out from that grouping into something called a community. And a community is all of the different living things that are interacting with each other in a given area, but just the living things. So if we were in a forest preserve here in Cook County, we could look at how all of the different plants and animals are interacting with each other, and we would call that a community of living things. So again, not how they're interacting with their non-living environment, but just their living environment. So you could talk about community in a tide pool, for example. So that's a, another widely um, sort of recognized community that we could study. And again, we're just looking at how these different things are interacting with each other. If we want to look at how the living things are interacting with each other and their non-living environment, the abiotic environment, that would be a studying an ecosystem. So that tide pool that we looked at, it wasn't just the community of things living in the tide pool. We're going to look at the water and the rocks and the air and the temperature and all of that too would be important. 
So again, lots of different ways that we can sort of approach the study of ecology, right? But what's sort of important here is once again, how living things are inter interacting with each other and also how they're interacting with their non-living environment. So the first major concept when we're studying ecology is we have to understand the role of energy. So when we were talking about sort of an introduction to environmental science, we said that we as humans rely on our environment for resources and for energy. So do every other living thing, resources and energy. So let's start with energy and talk about how energy moves through the natural environment. So everything sort of starts with the sun. So the sun is the ultimate source of energy. So all of the energy that is used is in some way or another derived from at some point from the energy, the solar energy that's coming from the sun. The first place to look in a natural system for energy is at plants because plants and other green organisms, so there are a certain group of um, types of bacteria and certain types of single-celled organisms called protists, they are capable of directly using solar energy and using it to convert carbon, um, atmospheric carbon, carbon dioxide, into to fixed product, what we call fixed product, which is, a, is basically a sugar. So it's the process of photosynthesis, and it's probably something you learned about a long time ago. And it's not necessary for us to rehash what photosynthesis is, but it's important to note that this is where energy flow starts. So in any ecosystem, energy flow starts with the group that is able to essentially produce or convert solar energy into what we're going to call chemical energy. We give those green things the name producers. So producers, again, can manufacture, they can make sugars. Sugars are molecules. They're organic molecules simply because they contain the element carbon, but don't worry about that. They make sugar and they use the sun's energy to do that. From there, we have two other groups of living things in an ecosystem, the consumers and the decomposers. So if you can't make your own food, if you're not a producer, you have to eat something basically. And that's what the consumers and the decomposers do. The only difference is what they're eating. Consumers are consuming other living things, right? So they are consuming plants. We would call them herbivores. If they're consuming animals, we would call them carnivores. Um, we also have not just the terms herbivores and carnivores, but we can also talk about what's called their trophic level. So a trophic level is where they fit in a food chain. So these levels here, producers, consumers, and decomposers, these are trophic levels. And our trophic levels can be broken down into primary, secondary, and tertiary. It just means what are you eating? If you're a primary consumer, you're eating plants. If you're a secondary consumer, you're eating those herbivores. And if you're a tertiary consumer, you're eating other carnivores, right? So it's just another way to look at a food chain. There are also things that are omnivores. They eat everything. They eat carnivores, they eat herbivores and everything in between. And then we also have a group called the detritivores and the detritus feeders. So they, they are eating technically, so they're eating the um, leftover thing, the animal carcasses, uh, leaf litter, other animal species, they sort of fall into that category. And then last but not least are our decomposers. So our decomposers are those organisms that are actually breaking down leaving things, or excuse me, dead and decaying things into their, their primary building blocks. So you're actually breaking things down into the nitrogen and the carbon and the phosphorus and those other elements that make living things. So again, here's just some sort of picture examples of our, our different groups. So you have a large herbivore, you have a carnivore, you have uh, decomposers, fungi are great decomposers. This is just sort of a visual representation. So if once again, we're looking at how energy is moving through an ecosystem, it's a one way direction that's part of a food chain. So over here, 
We're not picturing it, but this is the sun, right? So the grass uses the sun to create sugars through the process of photosynthesis. And then the energy is passed from the grass to the rabbit because the rabbit ate the grass. And then the energy is passed from the rabbit to the snake because the snake ate the rabbit. And then finally, the energy is passed from the eagle to the snake, um, excuse me, to the eagle from the snake because the eagle ate the snake. So again, you can see arrows that we use to dictate the flow of energy in a linear feeding relationship. So again, these trophic levels that I talked about are just links in a food chain. So the first trophic level were producers and then the primary consumers and the secondary consumers and so on and so forth. So this is how we once again look at how energy flows through an ecosystem. Notice that it's a one-way movement. What's also important to note is that when we're talking about energy, as you transfer energy from one level to the next, it's not 100% efficient. You are not actually converting all of the energy from this grass into energy that the mouse can use. What happens is that every step of the way, some of the energy is lost as heat. We can't do anything with heat. Heat doesn't do any work for us. It's not capable of producing anything. So we call it lost or wasted energy if you want to think of it that way. So that's why it's always sort of, again, it's, it's unidirectional, right? So we're not coming back to the sun in the end. This isn't a cycle of energy here. It's a one-way flow. And that's important to remember because that's a lot different than what materials do in an ecosystem. So in addition to food webs, excuse me, food chains, we also have complex feeding relationships that we call food webs. So a food web is simply lots of different food chains linked together. Because as we know, most organisms don't just eat one thing, they're capable of eating lots of things. So all of these things become connected in these complex food webs. So again, just to review, energy flows through an ecosystem. It's a linear, means it flows in a line, along a food chain or a food web. It goes from one organism to the next. And then, then when that food is converted into work energy, when the animal is actually using that energy to get something done, some of it gets lost and degraded into heat. Don't worry about the second law of thermodynamics. We didn't talk about it. Uh, the longer the food chain is, the less energy is available for the higher trophic levels. It just means that you get the most energy from the sun you get the most energy from the sun, and then there's less and less energy available at the higher and higher trophic levels. It limits the number of trophic levels, number one, and it also limits the number of organisms you find. So there's the most plants. There's more plants than anything else because there's so much energy coming from the sun. So you can have a lot of plants. After the plants, you have a bunch of herbivores. Why? Well, because there's an awful lot of plants to eat. So therefore, you can support a lot of things that eat plants. But as you move up the food chain, you'll note that there are fewer and fewer things because it takes a lot of energy in order to be at the top of the food chain. All right, so let's compare that with what happens in with matter in ecosystems. So we call these biogeochemical cycles. All right, if we break that down, it simply means living things require elements that are found typically in the ground somewhere at some point in the cycle, and they use them for chemical processes, for building molecules. So that's how we break down biogeochemical cycles. Important note, matter cycles through the organisms, which means you can't create or destroy matter, okay? So it has to end up somewhere. So it goes from one organism to the next and then into the non-living environment and then starts the cycle all over again. That's different than energy. Energy is flowing through the ecosystem. It's a one-way movement from the sun through living things. Energy doesn't end, back, end up going back to the sun at any step. So if you don't remember anything else, remember these two things, matter cycles and energy flows. All right, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about these cycles. Um, I have posted these quick videos that talk about uh, the carbon cycle, 
the phosphorus cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and the water cycle. So I'm going to actually let you use those videos to learn more about them. Um, you can also use uh, these are good diagrams. You've been given a copy of these in the lecture notes. So uh, again, I'm going to kind of skip through these, but what you should be noticing in all of these diagrams is these arrows, right? At some point, all of these elements go through living things and then back to the non-living environment. So, and then this here is the phosphorus cycle. And then the water cycle, we'll talk a little bit more when we talk specifically uh, about water. Last thing I want to hit on really quickly is how living things are interacting with each other, because that's sort of the other component here to think about when we're talking about ecology and ecosystems, is how living things are interacting with each other. We know that living things aren't independent. They're not an island in and of themselves. There has to be interaction. Sometimes the interactions are beneficial for everybody. Sometimes the interactions are harmful for one or both parties. It just kind of depends on the interactions. So let's talk about symbiosis first. Symbiosis are relationships between um, members of, of two or more species. Typically it's two. Um, you can have things where you have interactions that are beneficial to both species. You can have interactions where somebody benefits and somebody is neutral, they're not harmed, they don't care. And you can also have relationships where one person, or excuse me, one species benefits and the other is actually harmed. So you can look at a symbiotic relationship, for example, between pollinators and plants, right? So this is a great example of a relationship where pollinators and these can be birds, these can be bees, these can be bats, flies, all kinds of things. They get food and in return they provide a valuable service to the plants. They help the plants reproduce by spreading pollen from one flower to the next. So this is a perfect example of a symbiotic relationship. We actually refer to this as a mutualism. Everybody wins in this example. A commensalist relationship is where you have one species that benefits, but the other species doesn't benefit or is not harmed at all. So it's it's a commensal relationship. So um, tropical trees and epiphytes. So you have these trees that live in the tropics and you have other plants that live on the trees themselves. There's a particular type of plant called a bromeliad that does this. The tree, the tropical tree, is just acting as a place where this other plant lives, the, bro the bromeliad. The tropical tree isn't harmed, but it also isn't getting anything off of having this little plant live on it. But the little plant, the bromeliad, has a nice place to live up closer to the sun where it can access that solar energy. So we call that a commensalist relationship. And then last but not least is a parasitic relationship. So. Very simple, parasites harm their hosts. So we have both internal and external types of parasites, but anything like a mosquito or a tick, we would consider those parasites. They're sucking your blood. You don't benefit from that at all. You're harmed by it, but the tick or the mosquito gets a meal out of it, of course. So here's sort of, again, a nice chart that kind of summarizes these uh, different types of symbiotic relationships. Again, mutualist, commensalism, and parasitism. The next type of interaction I'm going to quickly talk about is predation. I think everybody probably knows what a predator-prey species relationship is. So predators need to catch a meal. They go after their prey species. Prey species don't want to be eaten, so they do whatever they can to avoid getting caught. So predators come up with some pretty inventive ways to catch prey. They can be really, really fast. They can employ techniques like camouflage to hide so that in the, their prey species doesn't see them. But prey species do the same thing. They also come up with some pretty inventive ways to avoid being eaten. So they can form communities and they can actually sort of keep a lookout on and alert other members of their community when a predator is nearby. They can make themselves look like something else entirely and not food. So there's lots of different ways that we see interesting interactions among predators and prey. And last but not least is competition. Life is a constant struggle for all living things. It doesn't matter what you are, whether you are a single bacterium or whether you are a giant redwood tree, life is competition. All living things are competing for food, water, shelter, space, and access to a mate if you're an animal. 
So what that means is you're always competing. You're either competing with individuals in the same population, okay, so squirrels fighting other squirrels for access to an acorn, or you're competing against another species entirely. So squirrels fighting with um, birds for access to seeds in a bird feeder, for example. Okay, so life is about competition and we always see living things competing. So that wraps things up for our ecosystem introduction. What I've done here is I've given you an overview of some important vocabulary terms and some important concepts that you should know to help you understand the key points of this particular topic.